Hi, my name is Jason Mays. I am the chair for the Beck Lean Committee, and I am here to talk about all the different tools for lean and what we're doing here at Beck. These are instructional videos to help you understand and maybe give you some visual ideas of how to do these type of tools. These tools will be, or these videos will be focusing on the last planner system, which is a group of tools a part of the lean construction method. We're going to be talking about whole planning, weekly work plans, percent plan complete, six week look aheads, and tracking variables as well. So I hope you find that these videos are great and help you understand lean construction. Hi, my name is Jason Mays. I am the chair for the Beck Lean Committee here in Dallas, Texas. And today I'm going to be talking to you about pull planning. It is a tool uh, that's incorporated in the last planner system and it's also in a, a part of a larger system called lean construction just to give you a brief introduction of lean lean is a process improvement and uh, continuous improvement philosophy and it helps you plan better schedule your work better and also keep track of what you are doing well as well as what you could be doing better so today we're going to be focusing on pull planning, which is the first start of the last planner system. Once you do pull planning, then you'll move into the weekly work plan, which incorporates six week look aheads, percent plan complete, and other tools. So today it will just be pull planning. First of all, to notice about pull planning, um, when you are about to do some pull planning, the idea is to notify the parties involved at least a week in advance. The actual name, pull planning, refers to the way you're going to be doing the planning, and that is actually backwards from the traditional mindset. So with that, you want to give the trade partners, or if you're an architect, the consultants and owners, as much time to prepare about this as possible. I would always send a meeting invite a week in advance and then follow up in that, that week prior to the pull plan with calling them, talking them through what's expected, what area you're going to be focusing on to create the schedule, and make sure that they come ready to, to commit to schedules. The second thing I would do is send them some information on what pull planning is, what lean construction is, so they can read up on it if they choose to. This video might be really good as well so that they can get a visual idea of what will be happening in the poll schedule. The poll schedule's idea is to eliminate all waste that's involved in the typical schedule so that we can really focus on the work at hand. It also is to gain collaboration and involvement from all parties involved so that we can make sure that this schedule is the best schedule for the team. It's not a silver bullet in scheduling. It, once you do a schedule this way, it doesn't mean that it will never change, but it's a very good way of bringing out more detail in a schedule. I'm going to go through, at first, the, the parts of the pull planning system and the material that you'll need for your pull plan. Then we will get into a pull plan schedule and talk about how you facilitate a pull plan. Right now, we've got several things that are mounted on this wall right here that are going to be used for this pull plan. First, we have a site plan, a floor plan for this area that we're going to be pull planning. This is an old drawing um, of a project of mine, but this is a, a fictitious project that we're working on. But it's always good to have something posted so that you can refer to it during the pull plan. You can look at the different details, look at the sked, uh, look at the layout of everything, and also commit to that. Draw on it, whatever you have to do. It could be a physical floor plan. It could be one shown through a projector. It could be through a model. However way, you want to make sure that you have references available so that you can look at those during the pull schedule. Second of all, I've got a uh, a decent amount of white paper here ready for the pole plan. I usually use about 15 to 20 feet depending on the size of the project. But uh, I like to post it up here. I like to use paper so that I could roll it up and save it at a later date and just write on it you know, what, 
what schedule it was that we did it and the date, and then I can save all of them. The second thing that's really good about paper is you can mark on it, write on it, whatever, and not have to worry about someone erasing it if it's a marker board uh, or if if you're using you know push tacks or these pens, you know that that would move around a lot more than just having it all on paper. Another supply is post-it notes. Typically, you want to use the larger sizes, anywhere from four to uh, four by four to four by six inches. And you want to get multiple colors. Every trade wants to have their own color. As I've listed here, we've got concrete, they're using blue. The electricians are using this color of orange. The plumbers are using this color of green. Milestones or inspections are using this darker orange. And structural steel is using the yellow. So you want to have enough so everybody can have their own color. If you have many people involved in this poll schedule, then you can alternate certain colors that are written on the different colors so that you can delineate between the two different parties if you have to use two, or if two parties have to use green. The third thing here is a constraints sheet. And it's over here in the corner. We like to keep track of all the constraints that might come up during the schedule things that are keeping people from doing work that might be problematic to the schedule, that's driving the schedule, whatever it is, we want to capture those to make sure that we are going to attack those and make sure they get done in the next couple weeks after this full schedule. And lastly, you want a room that's big enough for everybody to fit in. Typically, for a construction job, you want your PMs and your superintendents there. You want your decision makers in the room. So, if it's a foreman, that's fine if they're going to be running the job. But if they can't make decisions about manpower or about material, then you'll want to have those people in the room. So with that, we're going to start this poll schedule. So this is the day of the poll schedule. Typically, you want to allocate about three hours of time to this poll schedule. You want to communicate at least a week in advance the area and the schedule. Typically, you want to choose a schedule that's about 12 to 14, 16 weeks, and you want to do it about no less than six weeks in advance. So if this were to happen in six weeks, the first part of the schedule, you'll want to, have, you'll want to be taking place no earlier than six weeks in advance from today. I've put on there what we're pulling, and it's structural uh, structure completion. That is a milestone that we've chosen to focus on today. These milestones are usually generated by our schedule that we have to turn in either at the RFP or um, at, the, at the proposal stage of the process. We are required to turn in a schedule, as we all know, and many times we don't have as much involvement or input from trade partners or even consultants in that schedule at that stage. So with poll planning, what we do is we take those milestones and we put more detail in those and pull those milestones. Maybe it's breaking up those miles, milestones into many different milestones. For instance, say you have a, a project that's got 10 buildings in it, and the general schedule, the original schedule, had one milestone for finish out. Well, in a poll schedule, you would probably break out finish out by each building. So you would have 10 different pull schedules for each of those buildings. Now this first one you allocate three hours for. And it's because a lot of people are learning this new process, they're getting involved, and they're understanding this way to do work. After that, many times it can be a lot less time than that. Once they become more privy to how they can prepare, they can know what is expected of them, and then they can come prepared so that they can do it faster. So I would always allocate three hours, but like I mentioned, the preceding ones after the first ones usually go a lot faster. So we have the sheet that's ready to start poll scheduling on. We have the end date of what we are pulling from. And so we have, as you, if you can imagine, a, a group of people here that all have to do with the schedule. It could be architects, it could be owners, uh, trade partners, whatever it is. Structure completion is a construction date. 
you can do design development packages if you're an architect. Whatever the idea is, the, this helps you pull backwards so that you can plan and eliminate a lot of waste in the schedule. So let's get started. I've gone ahead and made up some of these tasks beforehand, but like I said in the first one, many of your teammates that are going to be involved in this pull schedule are not going to have a lot of these things created. So when you're doing a pull schedule, structure completion is the last thing that we are doing. So you step back one task from there and you say, what is the last task that you do to determine structure is completed? So the group, if once you start the pull schedule, you ask the group that question and they'll say, well, it's probably going to be roof decking. So the structural steel guy is yellow. As you can see on the board here, I've placed, it shows structural steel, it's yellow, and he has created the task, roof decking. How we've done these tasks are you put the actual task on this portion of the, of the post-it note and then you divide it in half and divide that in half. You have duration in this segment and then I have it abbreviated as HO or handoff. These are the items that that person needs in order to do this task, in order to start the task and in order to complete the task. This roof decking he has created it's a five week duration and he states that steel needs to be detailed and he needs his inspections done. So he comes up here and puts it, this is the first task right here. Now, as you look at this, time on this goes this way. So this is time, we're moving this way, all right? So we are gonna go backwards, all right? So this is the last task that we are gonna do is roof deck. Now he states in order to do this, he needs steel detailing and he needs it inspected. So that's a trigger. Inspections are, are dark orange and steel detailing is something else that he does. So roof steel details, he has, he has put up there 10 weeks. And then we've got inspections, full pen inspections, full pen, uh, full pen weld inspections. That'll happen, it's a one day task. They need the full pen welds done and they need it pre-inspected. They should have a pre-inspection list. In order to do the roof steel detailing, they need the erection complete and inspections. So we put up there roof steel erection. The structural steel guy will come up and put that up there. They need their columns hung. So he'll proceed that with columns. They need the base plates and slab on gray cured. So he'll set the base plates, and they need slab on grade and layout. So this helps us determine the flow of what is needed, and it helps start questions, collaboration, conversations, whatever it takes in order to make sure that when this task starts, that this person has everything they need. Now this one gets to the end of their scope of work, and this is the critical part, the handoff between the trades set base plate. Typically with a structural pull schedule, it's more simple than say an interior finishes, things like that. With interior finishes, you might have many more different tasks going on at the same time. A lot more handoffs uh, where other people are finishing work and the other people pick up. With structure, and especially with steel structure, that is not gonna be the case because many times you don't want people working underneath the steel, things like that. This is a one level project that we're pour, pour, uh, pulling. So it's a very simple project that we're looking at today. So he has slab on grade needs to be poured. And that is a trigger for the concrete guy to say, okay, I gotta start doing my task. 
So he says, first floor slab on grade four, that's a one day task. This is a 20,000 square foot building, not a big building at all. They can do it all on one floor is what they've talked about. That starts that conversation. Where we talk about, do we need to break it up? Are you okay with doing it one floor? Things like that. He needs inspection, rebar, MEP penetration check. So that's another trigger is he needs his MEP penetrations done. So we've got our plumber who is green and he's doing the plumbing underground. That's an 18 day task. So we're just gonna put that up there. Once again, this is time. These are days moving backwards in the schedule. Where they show up on here doesn't really matter just as long as they show up here in time. He also needs the rebar done, so that will be happening. And so you'll probably want your plumbing underground done before your rebar. They need formwork done and MEP penetrations done. So you've got your formwork. They'll be working on that as they're doing plumbing underground. They need grade beams installed, grading, underground MEP, and layout. So you've got your grade beam rebar, and you've got your grade beam form and excavate. In order to do grade beam form and excavate, you need piers and the pipes installed. Uh, that's one other test too, it's grade beam four, so that'll go right about here one day task. So you can start seeing the progression of this whole schedule as it's going forward and backwards. But you want to start looking at here to eliminate and start looking at any kind of waste that's going to be in the schedule. Electrical underground happens at the same time as the plumbing underground needs to be happening. So we'll put that right in line. It's when first floor slab on grade work, form work will start. And then we've got our inspections. So while they were talking about inspections needed, the person who's in charge of the inspections are writing these out. First floor slab on grade inspections will happen after the rebar. So that's a one day event. Grade beam inspection will happen after the rebar that is installed, as it's stated right here in the handoff. And pier inspections will happen after the piers are drilled and the rebar is installed. We've also got a check anchor bolt task that our structural steel guy has committed to. And he needs, the piers need to be drilled and the rebar installed before they can check those. So we have this back here after the piers are drilled. This is a pretty easy schedule, as we can see. Now, when you're doing a pull schedule, the idea is you get everybody to place what they think their durations are, their tasks, and things like that. And then you can start talking about the workflows, means and methods, and durations. Now, up here, I see plumbing underground is 18 days. And maybe in our master schedule, we had five days in there because it's a very simple project. There's only a couple bathrooms. There's not a whole lot of work. So we start asking the questions of that plumber is saying, what is really included in that 18 days? And we start digging into it. And he may say, well, you know, typically it lasts, you know, a week and I'm just throwing in there some fluff just in case we really mess up. And we say, well, no, 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 we're eliminating waste. So let's reduce that to five days. And he says, okay, we're eliminating waste. Let's do five days. Then we start asking a little more about it. We say, okay, what kind of uh, excavation schedule do you have? How are you gonna be installing them? How many linear feet do you do a day? And so we start digging into and asking questions about really what is he planning this work off of? And that also is an indicator knowing that we can say, okay, this person has done their homework, they've reviewed the drawings, things like that. So if they come to you and they say, well, you know what, I haven't even looked at the drawings, I haven't even tried it yet, and, and, and gone through the drawings, uh, this is my first day on the job, things like that, then that's not a trigger to us to saying, okay, let's help them determine what their schedule is. So we start talking about 
how many linear feet you can do a day, is there ways that you can prefab the underground plumbing, things like that. And we decide that they can do a lot more than they anticipated. So we even reduce this more to three days. And say, okay, we can probably do the underground in three days. We start looking at these other ones. Okay, peer drilling, that's five. We start talking to the peer drill about how many peers he's going to be doing a day. Are there peer caps that he thinks are going to be problematic? Things like that. And we determine, okay, five days is enough for him to do all the peers. Grade beam form and excavation, three days. As we go through this, we're finding out, okay, some of these are adding up. Electrical underground, he's got 10 days, which is two weeks. Five working days are in a week. So we start asking questions about that, what's really driving that number. And it is more of an electrically intensive job than a plumbing intensive job. And so we determine that's a good valid number. So the idea is to look at this and, and see what type of fluff is in the job, what can we eliminate, and even trend it to see, okay, is this way more than what we originally anticipated or is it way less? Is there ways that we can make up schedule or change the way we're doing our work. Maybe look at how we're doing our erection. And it's taken one week here, one week here, and 10 weeks to detail. So maybe we start having conversations with the structural steel guy about eliminating this to two weeks and see what it would take to reduce that to two weeks. Maybe it's talking about manpower, things like that. What's great about this schedule too is you can look at this and automatically get a frame of reference of your manpower issues on the job. Say you're a concrete guy and you say, okay, where am I going to be doing the most work? Well, it's going to be right in this here. So I know that I've got to have enough men. And you can go over that with the concrete guy and say, okay, are you going to have enough men? With the structural steel guy, he has one task way over here, and then all the rest of it starts here. So is he going to have men ready to come out to this job to do that check? at that time. You're talking about it and it's a visual it's a visual tool to learn and just use right as you look at this schedule. You can automatically see what is driving this. So this is your pull plan. You agree to this pull plan. You might even make notes of this has to be tied to this, you know. You can even do that. You can draw on this, do all kinds of stuff. Another thing I like to do is break it up into the months of the year. So say structural completion, and our milestone is going to be in January. So you can just write up here, January, as you, as you make your schedule, this is 10 weeks. And so say we negotiated and they said, okay, you know what, if we get two crews out here, we can do it in three weeks. So we change that. Three weeks, so December is right in here. November, and October. So that kind of helps break up the months right here. This really helps out because sometimes when you're doing a pull schedule, there's a piece of equipment or an owner moving or some date that is really driving the schedule that you have to build around. So say, for instance, we have structural steel coming and there's a portion of the decking that cannot come any earlier than January 15th. So we can just write a task, metal decking arrive. And we know that it's January 15th. And we know that steel roof decking cannot start any sooner than that date. So that this is where this helps out breaking up the schedule. So once you do a full schedule, you go around the table, you talk about it, you get people to buy off on the schedule and say, okay, is this something that we could commit to? Um, if there's any constraints that pop up during the schedule, they're saying there's submittals that are driving it or say, you know, they come up and they say, you know what's really driving this January 15th day is if they did a different type of thickness of decking or whatever the idea is, then you can list that as a constraint to start attacking that to see if there's a way that we can make this schedule better. 
So you would just list your constraints like this. One, metal, decking, thickness. And add, you know, list the question, can it be thinner? This is a list of items that the team is going to attack to make sure that we get resolved before this schedule starts so that we can make sure that we can hit these dates. So it's good to keep track of these, to talk about the constraints, to bring them up. If owners are not here or architects are not in this meeting, to bring it up and maybe an owner and architect meeting. If you're an architect and consultant, bring it up with maybe the general contractor Whatever the party is, whoever the party is, it's important to communicate what our constraints are and really driving these type of schedule. So we've got the pull plan. We've got a plan that everyone buys off on, everyone agrees to. They know that it's important. We can look at it, you know, maybe a week later we say, oh, let's add some things like, you know, maybe Christmas in here. New Year's because that's going to impact your schedule. You can make changes to this if you need to due to weather or anything like that, reschedule it. That's what's great about a poll schedule is that with the post-it notes you can move things around if you have to reschedule and you can make this always present in your meetings. I would always encourage you to break up as many as possible um, because you're going to be doing these repetitively. And so once you get into the hang of doing one of these pull schedules, the team will come in, they'll have, just like I had, they'll have their tasks pre-made. You come up, put up there, you move them around, and boom, you're done. So the more you have, the better off you are. You get more trained in that way. And the subs or the trade partners or the consultants, whoever they are, they get in that rhythm they know what to do, what to expect. What's also nice is you're always talking about the schedule that everyone agreed to. And if you have it in all your meetings, if you have it posted, it works out really well. If you have multiple poll schedules, then you can always just bring them out when you're talking about that duration of the work. If you're in this duration, roll this out and say, okay, now we're in this duration, let's do this. If we have a couple going at the same time, just stack them up however you do it, it's really good to communicate and show these as much as possible. You can even take pictures of them, and I would encourage you to take pictures of them and send them out and even post them on 11 by 17 maybe at the place of work so everyone kind of knows, okay, this was what we agreed to. So that if your job site trailers are further away or your, your team meeting rooms are further away from the job site, this helps communicate that at the job site level. So this is the first part of poll planning, and I would always at the end of a poll planning session do a plus delta. This helps track what you did well at this poll plan and what you can do better the next time. So a poll plan, a, a plus delta is a really simple tool to use. You ask for feedback. And so maybe they say the delta would be to get an architect in the room. If this is a construction pool schedule. So that's a goal of the team is let's try and get the architects involved in this process. The plus is it was short. That might be a plus. Um, good collaboration. Whatever the characteristics are, jot them down, write them on a note, put a date of when you did this full schedule, label it, and what I do is I just take a snapshot of this picture so that when I'm planning the next full schedule, I say, okay, what were we going to do differently that we said we were going to do? And so I work hard at trying to get an architect in the room. And then I say, okay, what did we do well that we can continue in the next pull schedule? So when you start the next pull schedule, 
you bring this up and you say, okay, this is what we said we were going to do. Maybe it was went too long. So at the next pull schedule, you would talk about it and say, okay, last pull schedule we said that we went too long. This one we're going to focus on doing it in the proper time. So that was, that's pull scheduling, and I hope this helps you out in understanding what pull scheduling is. Thank you.